You are listening to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Welcome to a fresh week. I am so glad that you're here and that you're tuning in and spending this time, not just me, uh, but really with women all over the world who are also tuning in and trying to stay cool, stay calm, stay balanced while working and raising children and just dealing with the stress of everyday life. And, you know, we all tune in and, and listen and connect on social media. And it's it really is like a family all across the world. So thank you for being a part of that. Um, And I'm so thrilled to share the work of my guest with you today. Her name is Phyllis Grant. She's an award-winning essayist, a blogger. Um, She was a chef and worked in some of the best restaurants in the entire world. And she is just out with a new book called Everything is Under Control. It's a memoir of her life. And she said she wrote it over the past 20 years. And they're just such... uh, interesting and and vulnerable and gut-wrenching essays compiled into this beautifully written book. Um, And so when I was reading about it, I I knew I would want to have her on the show because I feel like whenever we elevate voices of women who are, are okay with sharing really dark and real things with the world, it relieves the burden off of all of our shoulders so we don't feel as alone. And again, going back to the purpose of the show, that's exactly what it is. It's it's here to educate and and uplift and empower you. And I think by listening to Phyllis today, you're going to get all three of those things. Um, so without further ado, please enjoy my episode. If you love it, please share it with a friend. I've been loving your reviews. Um, I've decided to start sharing you know, a review a week um, just to, to say thank you. Um, so this one is from Hannah Black, and she said, My God, this podcast is amazing. I just discovered it a week ago, and I'm in love. The meditations are just the right length and incredibly impactful, and the interviews and topics are exactly what this tired mama needs. Ugh, hearing that or reading that makes me feel so good. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you all for your reviews. And like I said, I'll be sharing one um, every single week, so who knows? You might get called out. Uh, Thanks, guys. Enjoy the episode with Phyllis Grant. This episode is sponsored by SaveTheChildren.org. Save the Children believes every child deserves a future. In the United States and around the world, they work every day to give children a healthy start in life, the opportunity to learn, and protection from harm. They deliver lasting results to millions of children, including those hardest to reach. They do whatever it takes for children, every day and in times of crisis, transforming their lives and the future we share. Right now, the coronavirus is the biggest global health crisis of our lifetime, threatening children in every way. COVID-19 has already left many children without caregivers, out of school, and exposed to violence and exploitation. Child poverty is rising. With your support, we can help children in unsafe households and help support distance learning in the face of school closures. Here are some ways your support can make a difference. For just $5, you can buy a baby's first book, providing comfort and inspiring a lifelong love of learning. For just $25, you can serve a nutritious breakfast and lunch to five out-of-school children in need. Go to savethechildren.org slash savekids to learn more and to contribute. Today's sponsor is Hero Cosmetics. They sent us over the Mighty Patch, which is a hydrocolloid acne patch. And I actually had a pimple pop up last night, so I slapped on a Mighty Patch original, and in the morning, the pimple was completely flat. It was so cool. And I think as women, we're really used to dealing with harsh chemicals as a way to clear up acne on our skin. I mean, I'm in my 30s, and I'm still dealing with this, especially when it comes to ovulation time or PMS time. Like, they just come up. So to have have something that doesn't burn my skin and feel like it's tearing it apart is really incredible. And in the Mighty Patch, there's only one simple ingredient, and it's suitable for even the most sensitive skin types. And it's kind of cool. When you take off the patch, you can actually see the gunk from the pimple in the patch. So it's oddly satisfying, as gross as that sounds, to see how it's just cleared and cleaned up your skin. Um, And again, you put it on overnight, and what was once red and gross and disgusting is now this healed, flat surface. So definitely go to herocosmetics.com and use the code MOTHER15 and see for yourself. Well, hello, Phyllis. Welcome to the show. I am so glad that you're here. Thank you. It's really nice to be here, Liz. I appreciate it. Yeah. um, I'm just going to dive right in with a question. Um, What was the spark? What was the moment where you decided, okay, I'm going to write this book and this is what it's going to be about? I'm always so curious about that. 
Oh, wow. I love, I haven't gotten that question yet. I was just thinking, I was trying to count all these events that I've done over the past six weeks and, and it's like beyond being able to count anymore. And I've gotten a lot of questions and the same ones come up over and over again, but I haven't gotten that one. And I love that I, idea of a spark, but I think it's many sparks. I mean, I think that that's what this book, you know, at some point we can talk a little bit about the evolution of this book, but it is a, a collection of milestones in many ways in my life. So it's, I've been writing these stories for 25 years over and over and over again, kind of in a therapeutic way to friends mm -hmm. and emails and ways to sort of mark my daughter's um, birthday. I like to write her birth story and that's in the book. So um, it was more a collection of, of sparks, I would say. Um, but I did start a blog about 10 years ago called Dash and Bella. And that was a place to, tell stories, develop recipes, take photos. And I started collecting certain kind of stories, sort of some of the hard stuff mm -hmm. from parenting. And I realized the, uh, the response from the community I was building was really positive when I put stuff out there that was raw and difficult to talk about. So I think that that sort of guided this book in the end, getting some of that, the hard stuff in here that I went through and paring it down to a more sort of universal set of stories sort of the essence of these stories so that people could hopefully see themselves in this book. Yeah, I think that's that's so well said because that's exactly how I felt when I was reading it. It was like, it was almost like a fiction. You know, you're reading this and it's like, she gets it. Like everything that you're saying, like even about the birth story and um, it was so raw and so real. And as someone who went through, you know, two births, like I was right there with you, you know, in those moments and I and it brought me back in such a visceral way, how important was that to you to keep that rawness, to keep that realness in a book while also having like fun recipes and, and happy stories too? Well, I suppose, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to have one without the other in some ways, because the way that I have gotten through the past 17 years, having two kids and postpartum depression and husband who's out of town a lot and uh, the only way I've gotten through that is by cooking and by feeding my kids and by spending a lot of time in the kitchen, sometimes too much time. <laughs> I like to say sometimes that especially when my kids were younger, when it was so hard, I would cook for hours and the poor kids would be hungry at nine <laughs> o'clock. Like, mom, what's up? I'm like, oh, I'm cooking. <laughs> I'm trying to survive. Mm -hmm. So I use, I've used the cooking as comfort, as a way to ground myself. And it's just sort of, it's, it's woven throughout these stories because it's always been there. This love of, of being around the table, this love of, 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 of food. Yeah. I mean, and it's in your genes, you know, you talk about your grandmother cooking at 10 years old because she had to, um, do stories like that, did that, do you think that kind of led you into the kitchen? Um, uh, was it more of a, a natural progression or was it more of an escape? I mean, reading your, your time at Juilliard as a ballet dancer was amazing, that intensity. And then you, you bring, you bridge that with the intensity of the kitchen. And that to me seems even more intense. Um, so do you think the kitchen was kind of a savior for you or was it just another extension of kind of an intense lifestyle? I think it's all the same for me. I would say that the sort of the appetites in my life for various uh, creative things, I sort of, it's been uncontrollable. I, I, I've, I'm really good at being a beginner. I'm really good at diving into a difficult situation. I'm not so good as it progresses, but I'm, I'm good at being vulnerable and asking a lot of questions. So I would say with dance, with cooking, with being a birth doula, with writing, it's all sort of, it's just part of me. It's very, as you said, visceral, it's very physical, it's very emotional. Um, but the cooking that I've done at home in the past 17 years is really different from mm -hmm. that sort of the adrenaline rush of the kitchen or the, or dancing in New York. And that's partly what I love now that I, I turned 50 a few weeks ago. And I, I'm just so grateful to have more quiet cooking, um, cooking. It's just, it's, e it's easy. It's the only easy part. That's mm. what I finally have landed there. That's, that's where, that's where I, I'm most comfortable and those around me feel comfortable. And that's one reason it's been so hard the past few not months, not having friends and family in my kitchen, because that's just where, where I want everyone to be. And I, I like feeding people. So I miss yeah. that a lot. Yeah. Are you familiar with the Danish term Hugo? 
H-Y-G-G-E. Yeah, like, I sure am. Yeah, yeah. Like the comfort, like the, the blanket and the hot cocoa and the, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And just having yeah. like your friends around and having a good time with family and friends and you providing that environment. It sounds like that's what you do in your life. Like that's your favorite thing. Oh, totally. Yeah. And it really always has been. I used to cook when I was 10. I used to make all sorts of breakfast treats and cookies and stuff like that. And I would go down early in the morning and then I would feed my family waffles and yeah, going way back. I, that's just always what I've done. It, it comes also, I think that's why being a mom for me has felt in some ways really natural, just nurturing, being a mm-hmm. yoga teacher. Uh, I taught writing for a while. I don't know, the, the, the sort of nurturing teaching side of me is the, the, the side that's most accessible. The sort of being out in the world and performing and all that, that's, that's not, that's not mm-hmm. my comfort zone at all. Even though I sought out careers that were sort of uh, performative. I think I don't feel that there's anything performative now in my life, in my kitchen with my cooking. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It is a good balance because I think, you know, for a lot of people, they would completely shy away from putting themselves out there in a blog, in a book where you are getting raw and real. Um, there's people who would shy away from hosting a dinner party because there's too much pressure. So what do you yeah. think it is about you that that seeks that or has that desire to serve others, to put yourself out there, to uplift others uh, at the expense of you know co- being comfortable? Well, I guess it's just, it's so cool to spend an entire day cooking something and then seeing someone take a bite and seeing their whole body just relax or see them smile or just, I just, I picture my mom when I think about this, Mm. she's such a delight to cook for. She's so grateful and it brings her, it's, it's so little for me to do really to bring so much comfort and joy to other people. So I think that that it's just gratifying. Yeah. Yeah. So for the woman listening to this, who is not a fan of cooking, um, what, what would be your best advice to, to get into the kitchen, to maybe experience, you know, what you've experienced since you were 10 years old, this joy that is accessible to everyone. If you just give it a little try. Well, I guess cooking some of the same things over and over again, I think sometimes it can be really daunting because you say like, today I'm going to learn how to make a pie. Well, I've made thousands of pies and I've made thousands of crappy pies. <laughs> and, and tart dough is hard. I actually I had the opportunity to do some teaching last week over Zoom to some students and I taught them how to make tart dough. And it, it was a 17 minute video in real time making the tart dough. And that's, that's, that's a lot of minutes and it's a lot of details, but it was cool to be able to not just put it on the page, but actually show how to do it. So the recipes in my book, I have 17 recipes and they're more like templates. And I think they're, they would be pretty great for people who aren't necessarily comfortable with cooking because these are recipes I've made pretty much my entire adult life. Mm. And these recipes are so well tested and they're narrative. So a lot of details. So things like, like today, like if I were making tart dough, wow, if the kitchen's hot, be careful because the butter is going to, you know, it's going to get soft so quickly, move faster. So a lot of what I write in my recipes are those details. Like if you don't have arugula, you know, find another, find another chicory, find, uh, if you don't have pistachios, walnuts are fine. So a lot of my recipes give you the freedom to see what's in your space, what's in your kitchen, what's in your pantry right then and work with it. And now a quick break with a word from our sponsor. We all know that women are not the only ones that suffer from stress and anxiety, insomnia, and pain. Men suffer just like we do. That's why I'm proud to offer my line, Motherhood Unstressed CBD, at a discount just in time for Father's Day by using the code I love you dad at checkout. So if you are struggling to figure out a gift for dad, now is the time to give him the stress relief that he so needs. And, yeah. and that can bring some comfort because that allows allows you to play and not feel like you have to be glued to the recipe. Uh, So I think once I started stepping away from recipes, which is interesting to say since I write them, but once (laughs) I started stepping away from them, I felt more comfortable and confident as a cook. So finding that confidence, like choosing one recipe to make once a week for the next year, you'll be amazed between now and then what, what you learn just say, if you took tart dough, what you learn about butter and temperature and flours and, and salts and and you'll learn what the people around you like and don't like too. 
And it's also very tact, very tactile. So it's good to do with kids. Oh yeah. And you said too, like, I love how you said that, you know, you would just be cooking or baking and your kids would kind of just naturally navigate to the kitchen. And I find that too, in our household, like if you were doing anything that's a little more intricate, like they do, they always end up in the kitchen. It's kind of where everyone congregates and you have conversations and then we turn the TV off and put music on. How important is it to you to transfer these skills to your children? You know, even just the love of, of getting together, being in the kitchen, working with your hands. Oh, that's, that's a good question. It's almost like they don't have a choice and that sounds weird. And I don't mean it like I'm shoving it down their throats. It's more like I saw my mom and my grandma and my dad. I saw what having that joy in the kitchen brought to the whole house. And I'm hoping, and I'm, I'm sensing it more and more as my kids get older. I'm sensing that my kids feel the same way about our kitchen. Like right now, my kids are in the kitchen making their lunches and they're sitting there, they've made it themselves. That's really gratifying. And (laughs) they're, they're not taking it upstairs to their room. They're actually choosing to be down in the space together. So it's, it's pretty effortless. I can't believe it, knock on wood, but it it's, it's been pretty smooth. I think partly just because that's all they've known and that's all they've seen, but it's never been a punishment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think sometimes food with kids can be complicated because we want them to eat well, but as long as you just keep putting these things in front of them, they will open their minds. That's what I've learned. And their taste buds shift just like ours. At 50, I I crave things I didn't crave at 35. I mean, I eat a lot of anchovies. Now I eat a lot more acid. I just need a different balance. And I think kids are the same. And I think that giving kids the, the freedom, not just to play with cooking, but also to acknowledge that, hey, this month, I, I kind of do like broccoli. You know, and and then the next month, if they don't like it, that's okay, and not not feel like you have to punish them for it. I mean, I'm as guilty of that as anybody else. Sometimes I say, we, you know, you have to eat your cabbage. You know, that's all we have right now <laughs> during COVID. It's like <laughs> things have eased up a little bit, but yeah. So I notice I fall into that. So um, I'm sort of trying to remind myself of that as well. Yeah, it's true. Like it is strange when world events affect how hard daily life with a family is anyway. And then you add that on top of it. Talk to us though, about when you first became a mother um, and you, you were very honest in the book about dealing with, you know, postpartum depression and not necessarily bonding with your child right away. I think that is just so good to hear from another mother who's an amazing mother because I, I had similar feelings too. So I know I'm, I'm by far not the only one. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I had something called DMARE, which is dysphoric milk ejection reflex, so that when the milk let down, when my babies were breastfeeding, I would feel uh, for about 30 seconds this incredible, uh, well, this dysphoria, and I would feel like the world sort of fell out from under me, and I would have to hold on. And it was, it was just basically having depression, like, soar through your body. And with my first child, I didn't really understand what it was. It actually hadn't even been diagnosed in anybody Mm -hmm. yet. It was, no one had even heard of it. Um, So unfortunately, if you breastfeed your child for a full year, which I did, uh, and you have that feeling of dysphoria over and over and over again, uh, you, it's hard to bond with your child. And you have people around you saying, oh, look at your beautiful baby. Don't, I remember this when Bella was um, just a day old. I remember people coming in and saying, gosh, don't you love her so much? And I looked down and I I couldn't say this because it seemed like it would be just Mm -hmm. wrong and evil, but I looked down and I didn't feel any love. It's like it had, at the time I thought maybe I'll learn to love her, but instead I think it was just like this interference Mm -hmm. of the depression. And and so DMARE is not official postpartum depression, but it feels a lot like it. So women who experience postpartum depression often have the same thing where they just they can't get to the love. They can't access it because there's too much else interfering. So the thing for me that really helped with both kids is to start feeding them solid foods and to start to see myself as separate from my child. And I think that's, for whatever reason, that was a hard transition for me because they're inside you and then there they are in your arms all day long, right? And you're feeding them, however you're feeding them. And and having a little bit of distance is really, in particular with my second child, when I understood what DMARE mm-hmm. was, I knew I, need to, I needed to feed him solid food as soon as possible. I started taking pictures of him, which really helped. There was something about the camera 
mm. looking at him sort of separate through the lens. That was a really helpful thing for me. And uh, just with the second child, knowing that eventually I would fall in love with, you know, with both children, because I'd fall in love with one, I was going to fall in love with the, the next one, and giving myself the a bit of a break and, and just knowing it would happen. But you know, when you're middle of the, in the middle of that, it's hard to know what to do. It's a very, it's very depressing, very sad feeling. And I know it's very common. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we actually, I actually, one of the very first episodes I did on this podcast was with a woman who had Deemer. I had never heard of it before. Oh. She had just, you know, been diagnosed with it. She, no one really knew what it was. And she said exactly what you just did. It was like when the milk let down, her world was let down, you know, and it's just so many women I know have been dealing with this for so long and just covering up because, you know, as women, we're, we're supposed to just keep it moving, you know, Mm -hmm. keep it, keep it happy. And, and it's just not, that's not the reality. It's not the reality. Well, you know, that's one reason I wanted to write this book. You asked about spark, um, like that moment. And I, I think one of, one of the main reasons I wanted to write this book was to, to normalize some of these experiences so that, Someone could read my story and say, wow, I felt that too. And I, or I'm in the middle of feeling this, um, but you will come out on the other side eventually. And, uh, and I definitely did come out on the other side, but it helped me. I discovered a DMARE website um, about six years ago and I started reading through all the, the stories and it was like, I was reading my story mm-hmm. over. I read it for an hour and I just sobbed. I read one story after the next and it was, it was the same the exact same adjectives I'd used to describe my dysphoria. Wow. And that is so helpful because uh, it's, you think you have this singular horrible experience. And when you realize it's not singular, it's uh, it's, yeah, it's, it, it feels more manageable. Oh, absolutely. You don't feel crazy. Yeah. You know, I exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. As I'm, you're like, crazy. Hey, yeah. you know, yeah, I'm one of many. This is happening to so many. I think, and yeah. that's why, like, in reading your book, that's how I felt with the birth story, with teaching yoga, with like wanting to kind of just find this balance, find this zen while being, you know, a mother, which is always crazy. You're always being pushed to the edge. So, what works for you in your daily life to kind of get you back to center? I mean, you're writing books, you're doing this, you know, you're basically, you know, you're with the kids a lot because you're, like you said, your husband travels a lot. What yeah. keeps you centered and grounded and happy? Yoga for sure. And I've been doing that almost every day for a few years now. I mean, I, I've been doing it, let's see, oh, I started when I was 24 doing yoga in New York City. And then I was uh, trained to be a teacher when I was 30. So it's always been in my life, teaching it, practicing it out in the world. But the home practice is the big change. Mm-hmm. And I didn't manage to develop a home practice until about two years ago. And I've, I vowed to do yoga every day for a year. And I vowed to read two books a week for a year. Wow. That was, just, yeah, I was a little optimistic, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have to say I did, I did the yoga every day for a year. And sometimes that meant a two minute plank. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it meant an hour and a half. Mostly it meant if I could grab 10, 15 minutes, I would just do it. But it, it completely, it, I would notice this flip in my um, state of mind within about a minute, I, I would sort of track it. And I, I talked to my friend Margie about this as a yoga teacher, when we practice together, we practice together over FaceTime right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll tell her the moment I feel the, the mental shift, I'll say, oh, 10% better, feeling better, especially right now during the COVID mm-hmm. stuff. It's just been, uh, well, so hard for so many of us. And uh, it's, it's nice to be able to do something that's good for you if it's not a a martini which I indulge in as well but um not during the day (laughs) so (laughs) there's no judgment (laughs) (laughs) martini happens usually around six one never more than one but Mm -hmm. it's nice to have something that's good for you that helps flip that mental state and you know you have it like when my friend my best friend Marianne if she's having a hard time I always say go flip upside down Mm. just flip you know any way you can maybe that means Put your legs up the wall, lie on your back, just something that just reverses the blood flow. And most of the time you will feel a shift in, in a, a better direction for sure towards feeling a little more balanced. 
Yeah. Do you think it was your years in dance that kind of fine tuned you to really be in tune with your body? Like, it seems like you are hyper aware of your body and your feelings and your emotions more so. Like, I think a lot of people aren't as in tune. Um, it seems like you're really sharp on that. So is that something that you've always had? Hmm. I think so. I think that's just sort of how I've made my way through the world, uh, more physically than, uh, intellectually. I mean, I think the, in, the intellectual part of my mind has been something that I have uh, worked on as a, an adult. Like I went back to school and I got a second undergrad degree because I had a degree in dance and I really wanted to learn how to, how to read carefully, how to um, be analytical, how to engage in the world, how to, how to write a paper, how to write a thesis. These are things I didn't learn. And I learned mm-hmm. when I was 28. So, and I think going back to your question, that's partly because the, it's not like I was, com- well, actually it's not true. I was communicating with dance starting mm-hmm. about age six. All I wanted to do was move to New York city at 18 because I watched, well, not at six, but starting around age 10, I watched a TV show fame and I was obsessed with, with going to New York city and dancing. And so I just, according to my parents, I don't remember this, but I, I danced my way through my entire childhood. If I was mm-hmm. doing the dishes, I was moving. If I was in my room, I was in. So physically, I think that's just my, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am very physically aware. I guess the more intellectual side, I, I have to, it's more calculated and I have to sort of figure things out in a slower way, but physically I'm more intuitive. So I, I like that question because I think that that's just, we all are constitutionally different. We're all more comfortable with different sorts of um, intelligence. So perhaps mm-hmm. my, my strong suit is, is the physical. Yeah. yeah. But I think the world is really lucky because yes, you have that, that intelligence, that body intelligence, but then you did the extra work that was uncomfortable and, and you're sitting next to very confident 18 year olds, which I mm. love that line from the book. Oh, thank you. Um, and you're, you're pushing yourself to learn, to be able to write, to be able to communicate everything that you've experienced and have the intelligence to recognize, which a lot of people just kind of bury down so that other women out there can read your book and, and gain that knowledge and gain that, just that comfort um, that you've expressed. Um, I guess my question is, you know, you're, you dedicated the book to Matthew. I thought that was so cool. Mm-hmm. How has he been um, supporting you through through new motherhood, through writing a book, through all of your, your different career uh, choices. Um, how has he been in your life? Well, he's, he's been in my life for a long time since, uh, yeah, since 1990. And it's true. He has seen me choose to do a lot of different things, but it's always, it has always made sense to him. He's never thought, Oh, whoa, weird. Why would you want to write that? Instead, he, he actually edited my blog for years. Uh, so, uh, and he's a, a writer and a filmmaker and an actor. So he has a whole other separate world, but, but we do intersect in certain areas. Also food. He loves food. So he's always happy when I'm cooking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he's always happy to edit my work. And I edit a lot of his stuff as well. So what I love is we have very, we're very different. He, he is a performer. He, he is, he is out in the world in a big way. Um, and I am not, but we do have this intersection of interests and passions that, that have sustained our relationship, I would say. So yeah, he's been incredibly supportive, but I, I, I'm always stunned by how different we are. And this leads to, I mean, we, we've been fighting since we met, so, (laughs) (laughs) but I, I think that's a good thing. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, not when it tips over too far. And I write about that in a book, in the book a little bit, but, uh, just this sort of always questioning each other, keeping each other on our toes. Uh, it's, it's really good for a relationship. And the other thing is having time apart is really good for a relationship, at least for ours. Yeah. Um, so I think we're due for a little time apart. <laughs> We've had I think, a lot of time together. I think every couple in America in the world is due for some time <laughs> apart. I told you before this interview, my kids are at his coworkers with him and I'm just, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. <laughs> it is the air, the air changes. It's yeah. like, it's, uh, and I was thinking that as I was right before we talked, I did a little yoga and then I I washed my face. <laughs> Some things I don't know. <laughs> and lately, I've been, to, you know, I took, mm-hmm. took care of myself a little bit. But I could hear, I could hear Matthew downstairs. I could hear the kids cooking, and and that's c- comforting. But at the same time, 
um, it's so nice to not have all, as you said, I can't remember how you said it in the beginning, but there's something about um, programs interf- running. Exactly. So to actually have some time with yourself. Yeah. And I suppose that's what the yoga does for me is that, although half the time someone walks in in the middle, but mm-hmm. they also, do you, do you have pets too? Cause I know they, they're usually attracted to anyone who's trying to do anything yeah. for themselves. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, I have a big, big yellow lab and uh-huh. uh, he, when he was a puppy, he used to, I would do down dog and he'd be underneath me. Yeah. The down dog, totally. Yeah. But now, now I close the door. It really, it's everyone. And even my son lately this week, once a day, he said, he has said, mom, have you done your yoga? Have you done it? Have you done it? I think partly, I mean, he's almost 13 and my daughter's 17. So they, they understand they're also exercising a lot right now and that's helping their mental health, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, their school has been really good at encouraging them to, to have a schedule. And so summer starts today, actually the oh. kids just finished the last bit of remote schooling. So I think we're going to go into a whole different rhythm. So uh, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Yoga twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell Martinis at noon. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Slippery slope. Oh. <laughs> and so we've covered a lot of ground. I don't want to give away too much of your book. I want everyone listening to go out and get it on Amazon or um, from your website. Is there anything that you want to leave with the listener about motherhood, about cooking, about, about life? Wow. Sorry to draw a blank. Do I? Uh, well, I'm really, I'm looking, it's funny. I'm looking this way, which might seem weird that I'm not looking at you. I was looking at my book and because, uh, it is a wild thing to have your life in, in pages like this. Um, so I guess what I would say is this, if, if there's any way while you're dealing with issues that come up with parenting or marriage or, or cooking or anything. Is there any way you can write some of your experiences down, whether it's in an email or a text to a friend or just call someone and tell them the story when it's hard, it can help. And I'm really glad that I, for whatever reason, needed to write my stories down and it has helped me tremendously. And the wildest thing. I have a book. I mean, it's just like the the fact that I use this as sort of therapy and then it became, it has a life of its own. And I'm not saying everyone needs to write their way through the hard stuff and have a book at the end, but writing your way through the hard stuff can, can be helpful. And I guess that's what I would say. That's Mm, what I'm thinking about today. And a, a few friends have read read this book and immediately said that it makes them want to tell their stories. And, um, so I I like to think that if, even if it's just a handful of people, they, you know, we all, I, nothing particularly exciting has happened in my life, but I still have stories to tell. We all do. Yeah. Yeah. And you have really found your voice. I mean, it was like allowing people into your mind, into your soul in such a beautiful way. Um, I don't know. It's thank just you. exceptionally well written. So thank you. Thank you. Wow. That means so much. Thank well, you. Thank you for sharing your light on this show and uh, continuing to do work that is important in the world. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate it. You have been listening to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you love this episode, please share it out with a friend or on social media. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You just have to hit those five stars. You don't even have to write anything. And uh, as always, make sure that you're subscribed so that you never miss a guided meditation every Wednesday or every Monday, an interview with an amazing guest doing amazing work in the world.